Hello again, Econ 160, and welcome to another video lecture. Today, we are going to be using supply and demand to think about international trade. So earlier in the course, we learned about the theory of comparative advantage, which said that countries are mutually better off when they specialize in trade. But if we look at political debates in the real world, we often see that international trade is a politically very controversial topic. A lot of people seem to believe that their countries are made worse off by international trade, and many people think that their countries are being unfairly taken advantage of. And historically, anti-trade sentiment uh, can run very high and lead to protectionist policies that seek to restrict trade, like import tariffs. Uh, right? Even as we speak, uh, the United States and China are engaged in a very tense trade war, which threatens to upend decades of mutual trade and dependence on each other. So the question is, if the benefits of international trade are so well demonstrated by economic theory, then why is international trade still so controversial? And the answer to that is that our theory of trade so far has been incomplete. The theory of comparative advantage only showed that specialization in trade allows the country as a whole all right, as a whole, to consume more goods than if it produced everything on its own, and that's still true. But the theory didn't tell us who within that country would enjoy most of the benefits, or even whether everyone would benefit from the trade at all. And so in this lecture, we're going to be using uh, our tools of supply and demand to expand on our understanding of trade. We're going to see that when a country opens up to international trade, that there are actually going to be winners and losers. And so although the country as a whole is better off in terms of uh, its total consumption, some market participants are actually going to uh, be worse off because of the trade. And so these observations can explain why protectionist policies like import tariffs or other trade restrictions can sometimes be politically very popular. And so we're also gonna be analyzing the consequences of import tariffs and then we'll close the lecture by discussing some popular arguments for and against restricting international trade. So here are our learning outcomes for today's lecture. By mastering this lesson, you should be able to analyze the effects of international trade on domestic market prices, quantities, and consumer and producer surplus. Second, analyze the effect of import tariffs and calculate deadweight loss and tariff revenues that result from them. Third, explain why international trade results in both winners and losers within the domestic market, and discuss the factors that determine who wins and who loses. And finally, you should be able to discuss some common arguments for and against restricting international trade and give your opinion on each of them. So for the majority of this lecture, we're going to be thinking about the effect of international trade on a domestic market. And when we say domestic market, what we mean is the market for a good, uh, meaning the consumers and the producers of that good within a single country, and how opening up to trade affects those consumers and producers. And so naturally, if we want to study the effects of international trade on a domestic market, we have to start by thinking about what would happen in the domestic market if there was no trade, all right? And we have a specific word for that, which is autarky. So if a country is not open to trade, then we say that the country is an autarky, all right? So here's an example. Uh, here I'm showing you domestic demand, that's the demand from domestic consumers, and domestic supply, that's the supply curve from domestic producers. Okay, in one country's market for uh, bags of coffee, all right? And so what's the equilibrium price and quantity under autarky, meaning if there's no trade? Well, that's easy. We simply look at the domestic supply and demand curves, right? So uh, here's the equilibrium. Uh, the price of coffee is gonna be $25 a bag, and the equilibrium quantity traded is going to be 1,000 bags of coffee, right? So that's really simple. It's uh, what we've been doing this whole time. And what we're going to call this is we're going to call $25 the autarky price. So that would be the domestic market price if there was no trade. 
and we're going to call 1000 the autarky quantity. That's the quantity that's going to be traded if there was no, uh, if the market was not open to international trade. So what happens if this country then opens up its domestic markets to international trade? The effect of opening up to trade is that you expose your domestic markets now to international markets, and what that means is you expose yourself to the world price. Okay, so that means the price that the good is being traded for on international markets. And one thing we're going to assume is we're going to assume that domestic consumers and producers are price takers on the world stage. So that means that they take the world price as a given, they can't individually influence the world price, and they can buy or sell as much as they want at the world price. Now what's the effect of exposing your markets to the world price? It essentially forces the price in your domestic market to be equal to the world price, right? And let's think about why that is. Uh, if the price in the domestic market was going to be higher than the world price, then the problem is that uh, buyers are not going to want to buy at all from domestic producers. They'd rather just uh, buy the good from international producers at the lower world price, right? So the domestic price can't go above the world price. But what happens if the domestic price was below the world price? Um, in that case, domestic producers would not want to sell to any domestic consumers at that lower price, right? They would rather just sell all their goods to international consumers at the world price. So the effect of exposing your domestic markets to the world price is that you're basically uh, forcing prices in your domestic markets to uh, equal the world price. All right? So that's what happens when you open up to international trade. All right, so let's do an example. Uh, here we have domestic demand and domestic supply in one country's market for coffee. And we're going to ask what happens if this country opens up to international trade when the world price is $15, right, as opposed to their autarky price of $25. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is we want to draw a line at the world price of $15. So we're going to draw this line here to represent the world price. And the first thing you're going to notice is that at this world price, the domestic demand and the domestic supply are not going to line up, right? Uh, domestic demand is actually 1,400 bags of coffee at the world price, and domestic supply is actually 600 bags of coffee at the world price, right? And so there's going to be a difference here. Uh, does that mean the market is out of equilibrium and prices are going to be bid up? Uh, the answer is actually no, right? Because this time uh, the buyers and sellers are actually uh, exposed to international markets, and so what's actually going to happen is uh, the buyers, right, they're not able to meet their entire demand of 1400 from the domestic suppliers, but they can meet the demand by buying from international sellers, right? And so the excess demand is actually going to be satisfied uh, by imports. And the amount of imports is simply the difference between domestic demand and domestic supply, which is 800, right? So this distance here measures the number of imports that's going to be happening in this market. Okay, and so our conclusion then is that if the world price is below the autarky price, right, so the world price is below the autarky price, then domestic demand is going to exceed domestic supply, and the country is going to be an importer of the good. And um, we can also say that the international producers here have a comparative advantage over this country's domestic producers, and why is that? It's because in order for this country's producers to uh, satisfy um, all of the domestic demand, their marginal cost would be higher than international producers, right? Remember, in equilibrium, uh, price equals marginal cost. And so the world price is actually, you can think of it as the marginal cost for international producers. And in order to satisfy all of domestic demand, the marginal cost of international producers is lower than the marginal cost of domestic producers, right? And so the international producers have a comparative advantage, and therefore this country is going to be a net importer of the good. All right, so now let's do an example for when the world price is 35 instead of 15. So we'll start by drawing the world price at 
and we're going to notice that uh, the domestic quantity supplied exceeds the domestic quantity demanded. The domestic quantity demanded is 600. The domestic quantity supplied is 1400. Right, so there's a excess domestic supply of 800. What happens to that excess supply? Well, the domestic producers are going to sell it on the international markets uh, as exports. So the quantity of exports will be 800, and it's measured by this distance on the graph here. Okay, so our conclusion is that if the world price is above the autarky price, right, if the world price is above the autarky price, then the country is going to be a net exporter of the good. And we can say that this country's producers have a comparative advantage over the international producers. So we started the lecture by asking uh, who wins and who loses from international trade. And so to answer this question, we're going to need to know how to calculate a consumer and producer surplus when a country opens up to trade. And so let's do that now uh, using our example from when the world price is $15. So this is the same uh, domestic supply and demand curve that we had before. The world price is $15. And we're going to ask who are the winners and losers uh, of opening up to international trade um, through a three-step process. First, we're going to ask what is consumer and producer surplus uh, when the country is not open to trade, so under autarky. Then we're going to ask what is consumer and producer surplus when the country does open up to trade. And finally, we can ask what is the change in consumer and producer surplus. Uh, and that's going to tell us what the, uh, who the winners and the losers from international trade are. Uh, so let's go ahead now and do question number one. What is consumer and producer surplus under autarky? Uh, well, we already learned how to do that. Uh, consumer surplus is the triangle, which is below the demand curve and above the autarky price, okay, because this is the price that's going to result in the market under autarky. And producer surplus is this triangle, which is below the autarky price and above the supply curve, all right? Uh, so the base of the consumer surplus triangle is 1,000 and the height is 25. So consumer surplus is 1 half times 1,000 times 25, which gives us 12,500. Producer surplus, the base is also 1,000, the height is also 25, and so producer surplus is 1 half times 1,000 times 25, which is again 12,500. So here's our consumer and producer surplus under autarky. Okay, next let's answer question two. What is consumer and producer surplus when the country opens up to international trade? Uh, so to do that, um, we have to remember that consumers under international trade are now purchasing 1,400 units at the world price, right? Whereas domestic producers are only producing 600 units at the world price, okay? And so consumer surplus is going to be this big blue triangle here, which is um, beneath the demand curve and above the world price. And the way you want to think of that is we're adding up the domestic consumer's marginal benefits minus what they actually pay for the product, which is the world price, and we're going to add it up all the way up to the quantity consumed, right? So that's how you want to think of the consumer surplus under international trade. Uh, so how about the producer surplus? It's this red triangle here, which is above the domestic supply curve and below the world price. And again, how do you want to think of this? You want to think of this as we're adding up uh, the price that producers are getting, which is the world price, minus marginal cost, and we're going to add, add it all up, all the way up to the quantity which is actually being produced, which is 600, right? Um, so this is consumer surplus under trade, and this is producer surplus under trade. Uh, so let's calculate that. For consumer surplus, the base is 1400, and the height now is 35. Uh, so we get consumer surplus is now 24,500. Producer surplus, the width is 600 and the height is 15. And so producer surplus now has fallen to 4,500. Okay, uh, and so what's the change in consumer surplus, producer surplus, and total surplus? 
Well, the change in consumer surplus, we went from uh, 12,500 to 24,500, so that's a gain of 12,000. Uh, consumers are better off by a amount of $12,000. Producer surplus went from 12,500 to 4,500, uh, so that's a loss of 8,000. So producers are now $8,000 worse off under trade. And what's the change in total surplus? Well, good thing the consumer surplus, the gains, outweigh the losses to producer surplus by 4,000, and so the change in total surplus is 4,000. All right, so market participants in the domestic country as a whole are better off by about $4,000. And that's the difference between the change in the consumer surplus and the change in the producer surplus. So our example shows that when the world price is lower than the autarky price, then the country is going to be a net importer and opening up to trade is going to benefit the domestic consumers, but it's going to hurt the domestic producers. And this is because the domestic producers, uh, they're hurt because uh, international producers are more competitive than them and therefore are going to take uh, away some of their market share. And so they're going to lose profits. On the other hand, domestic consumers win because they now get to buy the good at the lower international prices from more competitive uh, international producers. Overall, though, the benefits to the domestic consumers outweighs the harm to the domestic producers, thus resulting in an increase in the total surplus in the domestic market. And so we can say that the outcome under international trade is more efficient than under autarky because this is what's going on. Uh, consumers are now able to buy from more efficient producers, right? The international producers who have lower marginal costs than the domestic producers. And so this actually increases the gains from trade, right? Because we're now able to derive our consumer benefits uh, at a lower overall cost uh, than if we were buying from domestic producers. Uh, so that's one effect. And the second effect is that the number of surplus generating transactions is also expanding, right? Because under autarky, uh, only 1,000 transactions were taking place. But under international trade, we actually have 1,400 transactions taking place. Uh, so the not only is the market expanding, but consumers are able to purchase from more efficient producers. And so these are the reasons why the outcome under international trade is more efficient than under autarky. So now let's do the same exercise when the world price is $35 instead of $15. And so this country is going to be an exporting country. And let's compare consumer and producer surplus before and after opening up to international trade. So question one, what is consumer and producer surplus under autarky? It's actually going to be the same as before because we have the same domestic supply and demand curves. So this is consumer surplus. This is producer surplus. And it's the same as last time. Consumer surplus is 12,500. And producer surplus is also 12,500. Okay, question two. What is consumer and producer surplus when the country opens up to trade? Uh, so consumer surplus is going to be this triangle because we're adding up the domestic consumer's marginal benefits minus the price they're paying, which is the world price, up to the quantity consumed, which is 600. Producer surplus is this big red triangle because we're adding up the price that they get, which is the world price, minus marginal benefit, and we're going to add that up, up to the quantity which is produced, which is 1400. So for consumer surplus, the width of the triangle is 600, and the height is 15. So consumer surplus is 1 half times 600 times 15, which is 4500. Producer surplus, the width of the triangle is 1400, the height is 35, and so producer surplus is 1 half times 1400 times 35, which is 24,500. All right, and so now we can calculate the change in consumer and producer surplus. Consumer surplus fell from 12,500 to 4,500, so it's a loss of 8,000. 
Producer surplus went up from 12,500 to 24,500. And so it's a gain of 12,000. And so the net gain in total surplus is 4,000. So from this example, we learned that when the world price is above the autarky price, so that the country would be an exporter, then opening up to trade is going to benefit the domestic producers, but it's going to hurt the domestic consumers. And this is because the domestic producers, they're better off because they can now sell to international consumers who are willing to hit, uh, pay higher prices than the domestic consumers, right? So producers are now able to sell for higher prices than they would be able to get from just the domestic market. And the domestic consumers, they naturally lose from this because they now have to pay the higher prices that international consumers are willing to pay. Overall, though, the benefit to the domestic producers in this case outweighs the harm to the domestic uh, consumers, which results in an increase in total surplus in the domestic market. And so again, we see that whether the country is going to be an importing country or an exporting country, Either way, international trade uh, is more efficient. And for an exporting country, it's because that producers are now able to sell to consumers who have higher marginal benefits, right, which increases the gains from trade. Uh, and so it's a net benefit overall, right, because you're selling to consumers who actually value the product more uh, than your domestic consumers. And not only that, um, but the number of surplus generating transactions is also increasing, right? Uh, under autarky, we would have a thousand transactions. Uh, under international trade, we now have uh, 1,400 transactions taking place. So the market is expanding um, and we are getting more gains from trade by selling to higher marginal benefit consumers. So now let's talk about, in practice, how people in real life feel the effects of international trade and whether or not international trade should be restricted given that there are winners and losers. So the first thing that you want to remember in terms of how people feel the effects of trade is that most people in the economy are both producers and consumers, right? Uh, we're producers in the industries in which we work and we're consumers in everything else. And so how do people feel the effects of trade? Um, so in terms of the benefits to trade, um, Remember, if you're in an exporting market, then uh, producers benefit and consumers are hurt. If you're in an importing market, uh, it's the consumers who benefit and the producers who are hurt. And so people experience the gains from trade in this way. For people who work in the exporting industries, they experience the benefits from trade as an increase in income and um, employment in those industries. And for markets where the country is not an exporter, but an importer, then people experience the benefits from trade through lower prices in those markets and possibly a greater variety of goods as well. Now, how do people experience the downsides or the costs of trade? Uh, so in countries, sorry, in industries that are threatened by international competition, right? So in industries in which we uh, import a lot of our products, people experience the cost of trade as decreased income and job losses in those industries as our domestic producers are outcompeted by international producers. And um, we can also experience as consumers the cost of trade through higher prices in markets in which the country exports. All right, so these are the ways that in practice, uh, people experience the, both the benefits and the costs of trade um, as consumers and producers in various markets. So one of the consequences of international trade is that industries threatened by international competition will have income and job losses. And so that's one of the reasons why international trade can be so politically controversial, because for some industries, the job and income losses due to opening up to trade can be quite severe. And so an example of this can be seen in the history of American apparel manufacturing. Uh, between 1999 and 2019, the output of the domestic U.S. apparel manufacturing fell from uh, just under $80 billion worth of product to just about $20 billion worth of product. Uh, 
while at the same time, net imports rose from 70 billion to 130 billion. And over the same period, US employment in the apparel industry fell from over 600,000 people working in that industry to uh, around just 130,000. So that's a 75% decline. And so it's actually pretty understandable why some people who work in these industries might feel threatened by international trade. They took our job! But the question is, does this mean that trade should be restricted uh, so that we can protect the jobs and incomes of people who work in these threatened industries? And one can definitely see the, the appeal of protecting jobs and incomes, but most economists would argue that this is going to be counterproductive in the long run. Because by restricting trade, what you're doing is you are artificially maintaining an inefficient state of affairs that wouldn't survive in a free market equilibrium. And so economists would argue that instead of trying to protect jobs by artificially supporting an uncompetitive industry, it would be more efficient in the long run to help those people transition to jobs in more competitive industries. Right? And so by focusing on industries that the country has a comparative advantage in, the idea is that we'll ultimately be able to increase the total amount of goods and services that our people can consume, and that's what's predicted by the theory of comparative advantage. But despite what economists believe about international trade, uh, sometimes anti-trade sentiment still wins the day politically and restrictions on international trade become public policy. And so it's important for us to understand how to analyze the effects of restrictions on trade. And one of the most common types of trade restrictions are what's called import tariffs. So an import tariff is simply a tax on imports. And because it's a tax, the main effect of it is to raise the effective world price, which is faced by domestic consumers and producers. Uh, so here we have a diagram showing a domestic market along with a world price of $15. If an import tariff of $5 per unit imported is uh, levied on international transactions, what that's going to do is it's going to push the effective price that domestic consumers and producers face on the world market up by exactly the amount of tariff, $5. So instead of paying the world price, Producers and consumers in our domestic market now have to pay the world price plus the tariff. All right, and so what does this do uh, to the market? The main effect is that it's going to reduce the number of imports, right? So before the tariff, uh, the number of imports was 800, right, as measured by this line. That's the difference between domestic demand and domestic supply at the world price without the tariff. But after the tariff, imports drop to 400. And that's this line over here, right? Because now at the world price plus the tariff, domestic demand is 1,200 and domestic supply is 800. And so imports are only 400. So that's the main effect of the tariff, which is to reduce the number of imports and raise the effective world price, which is faced by domestic consumers and producers. So now let's analyze the effect of the tariff on consumer and producer surplus and on total surplus. So to do that, we're going to do two things. We're first going to calculate consumer and producer surplus without the tariff. And second, we're going to calculate consumer and producer surplus with the tariff. And we're also going to calculate how much revenues the tariff generates for the government. Okay, so number one, calculating consumer and producer surplus without tariffs. Uh, we already did this in the earlier examples, right? Uh, to get consumer surplus, we simply add up marginal benefit minus the world price up to the quantity consumed when there's no tariff. To get the producer surplus, we add up the world price minus the marginal cost up to the quantity produced when there's no tariff. Okay, and so we already saw that consumer surplus would be 24,500 and producer surplus would be 4,500. And now let's calculate uh, consumer surplus, producer surplus, and tariff revenue with the tariff. And so now to calculate consumer surplus, 
what we want to do is we want to add up marginal benefit, but not minus the world price, but rather minus the world price plus the tariff, right? Because that's what consumers are actually paying. And we're going to add those up all the way up to the quantity consumed with the tariff, which is 1200, right? And to calculate producer surplus, we're going to want to add up the world price plus the tariff. Uh, because what happens is the market price that the sellers are selling at now is the world price plus the tariff, not the world price, right? And so we want to add up world price plus tariff minus marginal cost up to the quantity produced, which is 800. And so here's our producer surplus. Uh, so to calculate consumer surplus, the width of the triangle is 1200 and the height is 30. And so we get a consumer surplus of 18,000. The producer surplus, the width of the triangle is 800 and the height is 20. And so we get a producer surplus of 8,000. Okay. And finally, let's calculate tariff revenues. Tariff revenues are equal to the number of imports, which is 400, right? Times uh, the amount of the tariff, which is five. And so the tariff revenue is 2,000. And visually, we can represent the tariff on the graph with this rectangle here, right? Because this is multiplying the number of tariffs, which is the length of this rectangle, right? Times the size of the tariff, which is five, which is the height of the rectangle. So that's our graphical representation of tariff revenue. All right, so now we're in a position to calculate the net effects of the tariff. Uh, so before the tariff, the consumer surplus was 24500 and producer surplus was 4500 Of course, there was no tariff revenue before the tariff, and so the total surplus is simply adding up CS and PS, and that's 29000 Now after the tariff, we calculated that consumer surplus is 18000 producer surplus is 8000 and tariff revenue is 2000 and so the total surplus is adding all of that up, consumer surplus, producer surplus, and tariff revenue. And that gives us a total surplus of 28,000. And so in terms of the change, the tariff reduced consumer surplus by 6,500. It increased producer surplus by 3,500. It generated tariff revenues of 2,000. And the net effect on total surplus was actually negative it decreased by 1,000, all right? So here's the conclusion from our example. It shows us why domestic producers often want to lobby for import tariffs, because uh, if they can protect themselves from international competition, that is going to increase their producer surplus. But there's a downside, which is that the tariffs are going to make consumers worse off because it's going to force consumers to pay higher prices than they otherwise would have. And in fact, the gains that the producers get and the tariff revenue generated together do not outweigh the loss in consumer surplus, and so tariffs always result in some deadweight loss. And because of this reason, economists are usually opposed to setting high tariffs. Now, a really infamous example of tariffs from U.S. economic history is the Smoot-Hawley tariffs of 1930. The Smoot-Hawley bill raised tariffs on over 20,000 imported goods and brought U.S. tariffs up to their second highest level in American history and the highest for over 100 years at the time. And at that time, over 1,000 economists and business leaders, including Henry Ford, uh, signed a petition to oppose the bill, but it passed anyway. Uh, like I said, sometimes anti-trade sentiment wins the day. And this triggered an international trade war. And American imports and exports both fell by about two-thirds, and so did uh, global trade flows. And many historians believe that the Smoot-Hawley tariffs were a major contributing factor in the Great Depression. And some even argue that it contributed to the circumstances which uh, led up to World War II. And the Smoot-Hawley tariffs are such a notorious example of protectionism gone wrong uh, that Al Gore actually used it to troll Ross Perot in a 1993 debate over NAFTA. Let's take a look. <laughs> 
oh, this works. If it doesn't work, you know, we give six months notice and we're out of it. But we've also had a test of his theory. When? In 1930, when the proposal by Mr. Smoot and Mr. Hawley was to raise tariffs across the board to protect our workers, and I brought some pictures too. You brought some Ross pictures? Is a protectionist? This is this is a picture of Mr. Smoot and Mr. Hawley. They look like pretty good fellas. They sounded reasonable at the time. A lot of people believed them. The Congress passed the Smoot-Hawley protection bill. He wants to raise tariffs on Mexico. They raised tariffs and it was one of the principal causes, many economists say the principal cause, of the Great Depression in this country and around the world. Now I framed this so you can put it on your wall if you mm -hmm. want to. Okay, hopefully you enjoyed that little segment. Uh, let me close the lecture by talking about some of the arguments that people do make in support of restricting international trade. And the purpose of this section isn't to offer support or opposition to any of these arguments, but simply to offer some perspectives on each of them. Uh, so we already heard the jobs argument that we should restrict international trade in order to protect domestic jobs and income. Uh, but economists would argue that it probably makes more sense to help people get retrained for a more competitive industry. Um, but there are other arguments for restricting trade besides just the jobs argument. One of these is the national security argument. So it might be crucial for the national security of our country uh, for us to have a healthy domestic industry and some goods, right? So of course, uh, it's important for national security that our country has the capability to manufacture our own weapons, but other goods such as food and medicine might also be important for national security. And I think this uh, COVID-19 pandemic that we're currently in, for example, uh, did lay bare uh, our country's uh, lack of industrial capacity in certain basic medical supplies and pharmaceuticals, and it's currently causing many policymakers to reevaluate our reliance on other countries, in particular China, for these goods. There is also what's known as the infant industry argument, and here it's sometimes argued that certain young domestic industries should be protected from international competition until they are mature enough to compete in world markets. And the root of this argument is this idea that many industries have what's called economies of scale. Uh, that's a concept that we're going to encounter in greater detail later on in the course. But for now, you can think of economies of scale as the idea that when an industry or firm gets larger and more mature, it's going to be able to reduce its marginal costs through investment in better technology, or simply by becoming more efficient with the available resources. And so the infant industry argument says that uh, young domestic industries need protection from international competition until they're able to achieve economies of scale. And that if we open up to international trade too early, uh, we would stifle some promising domestic markets and industries. So an interesting historical example of the infant industry argument comes to us from economist Joan Robinson, who was observing the consequences of Portugal opening up to free trade with England in the 1800s. Uh, Portugal had a comparative advantage in producing wine, which is an agricultural good, while England had a comparative advantage in producing textiles, which is a manufactured good. And Robinson noted that after opening up to free trade with England, the growth of Portugal's domestic manufacturing industry suffered greatly. Uh, so she wrote that the imposition of free trade on Portugal killed off a promising textile industry and left her with a slow growing export market for wine. While England, exports of cotton cloth led to accumulation, mechanization, and the whole spiraling growth of the Industrial Revolution. And so she attributed Portugal's lack of manufacturing growth and development to the opening up of free trade. Um, of course, Robinson's observations are only correlational and not necessarily causal. One could argue that if Portuguese manufacturing truly did have a bright future capable of competing with England, uh, 
then private investors would have invested to grow Portuguese manufacturing anyway. And that the fact that this didn't happen could suggest that investors didn't actually believe that Portuguese manufacturing would have become competitive with England's. And so if the investors were right, then artificially protecting Portuguese manufacturing would only have led to the development of an uncompetitive domestic industry sustained only by protectionist measures. Uh, ultimately, we'll never know exactly what the fate of Portuguese manufacturing would have been uh, with or without free trade with England, um, but these are some interesting arguments and factors to consider. So another argument you often hear is the unfair competition argument. And so people who argue this say that international trade does not occur on a level playing field. Uh, for example, some countries might subsidize their exporters and thus making their industries appear more competitive in the world market than they really are. And so uh, these people would suggest that trade restrictions should be used as a remedy to these unfair practices and to level the playing field. And so when we evaluate this argument, we should consider how these unfair practices actually end up hurting or helping domestic uh, producers and consumers, right? Because when another country subsidizes its exports, the effect is actually to make that good available to domestic consumers at even lower international prices. For example, if China subsidizes its manufacturers, uh, or even manipulates its currency so that Chinese goods appear cheaper to U.S. consumers, who ultimately benefits from that? U.S. consumers ultimately benefit from being able to buy goods at low, low prices. But does this mean that the unfair trade argument is illegitimate? Uh, not necessarily, right? So economists should avoid assuming that the purpose of economic policy is simply to maximize total surplus, uh, and non-economists should avoid assuming that all economists care about is total surplus. Um, because although maximizing total surplus is usually going to be a good thing, there are other factors to consider as well. For example, some people might think it's acceptable for domestic producers to lose to international competitors as long as the competition is fair and they're playing on a level playing field. But they might find it morally unacceptable if domestic producers are losing to international competition uh, when the competition is unfair. And so for these people, a level playing field might be a cause that's worth pursuing in and of itself in the name of fairness, regardless of total surplus, right? Uh, along similar lines, another factor that people may find important is whether the country that they're trading with shares similar values. Some people might find it morally unacceptable, for example, uh, to trade with countries that are violating human rights, even if, they, even if that means uh, less total surplus in the domestic market. So all that to say that uh, there are other factors to consider when it comes to things like fairness and human rights and other values that people care about. And finally, there are some people who argue that uh, international trade is leading to growing income inequality and negative social effects. We've already seen that international trade can create winners and losers, and in particular, people working in domestic industries that are not internationally competitive uh, are going to see a loss in jobs and income. Now, the problem is if these jobs and uh, income losses are concentrated in already vulnerable populations, then there's great potential for negative personal and social effects. Uh, so for example, um, a recent uh, paper came out showing that deaths of despair increased in areas that were more vulnerable to trade liberalization. Uh, so there were more people dying from like mental illness and suicide and anxiety. Now, the standard answer to the jobs critique is that people who lose jobs in industries affected by trade uh, should simply seek jobs in more competitive industries. Um, but you know, this might be easier said than done if the barriers to becoming re-educated as an adult uh, is very high, right? Education can be very costly. Um, or if there's age discrimination in the labor market so that employers uh, don't wanna hire uh, older people uh, for entry-level positions. Um, or if geographic mobility is limited, right, if people have 
uh, roots in the community and it's not easy for them to simply pick up and move to where the jobs are. Uh, so these are all factors to consider when we think about the arguments for and against restricting international trade. Okay, so that's the end of today's lecture. Thank you for sticking around till the end. Uh, here's a quick review of what we talked about. First, uh, by opening up to trade, a country exposes its domestic markets to the world price. And if the world price is below the autarky price in that country, then the country will be a net importer. If the world price is above the autarky price, then the country will be a net exporter. And if the country is a net importer, then consumers will be the ones who benefit from international trade uh, through lower prices, but producers will be harmed by the international competition. However, the gains to consumer surplus will outweigh the loss to producer surplus, leading to a net gain in the total surplus of domestic market participants. It's opposite for an exporting country. In an exporting country, it's the producers that benefit from the higher international prices, and consumers will be hurt by those higher prices. But again, the gains to the producer surplus will outweigh the loss to the consumer surplus, leading again to increased total surplus. Import tariffs are a way of restricting international trade. An import tariff will reduce the amount of imports and it will increase producer surplus, but at the expense of reducing consumer surplus. And the loss in consumer surplus due to a tariff is going to outweigh uh, the sum of both producer surplus and tariff revenue. And so import tariffs result in deadweight loss. And finally, um, although economists mostly support free international trade, we do recognize that there are a number of legitimate arguments for restricting or at least managing the consequences of trade, uh, despite its generally positive effect on total surplus. Uh, so just be aware of what those arguments are and you can form your own opinions. All right, so that's it. Um, I will see you all in the next lecture. Bye-bye.